here we are. Music education. Go and practice, kids. Done. It's over. Catch you later, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Musician's Map podcast. Thank you to everyone who has shown their support by getting a copy of the Musician's Map ebook and or audiobook, sharing the podcast with their friends, liking the Facebook page. Please keep it up, share it around, and help make sure the podcast continues. Are you musically educated? Some of you might be. Maybe you have formal training in the form of a degree. Maybe your training is experience-based. Maybe you're a total newbie. Whatever level you're at, being educated in music is a lifelong journey that goes hand in hand with life as a musician. This episode, I'm talking to fellow podcaster, professional drummer, and importantly, drum tutor, Andrew Rooney. Andrew has played almost every type of gig you could imagine. He teaches drum students at the Auckland Drum School, and he hosts the New Zealand Drummer Podcast. Andrew is here to dispel some myths surrounding music education. We talk about the misuse of the word talent, prioritizing gear over skill, learning how to sight read, finding inspiration, staying motivated to practice, and speaking the language of music. I thought it might be fun to debunk some myths. Oh yeah. First off. Okay. Let's see if you agree with with these points. <laughs> Oh, we, oh, we're rolling, right? Are you rolling? I'm rolling, yeah. All right, all right, here we go. So, my first one. I'd call it the talent myth. Yeah. Oh, I love it already. Dude, talent, just take the word out of your vocab. It doesn't exist. It's not a factor. It's not a thing. It's a crutch for lazy people to rest on. Yes. I'm not talented, therefore I can't play the drums. I can't play the guitar. I can't work up the ladder at my job. I can't lose weight. Whatever. Mm. Just delete it from the vocab. You know what, actually, what bugs me most about talent? Oh, there's two things. It's the opposite. It's when people have a little bit of natural talent. I'm going to relate everything to drums mostly because we're both drummers and we both teach drums. Mm -hmm. When they, they can play a bit of drums and so you, you know, you're naturally talented. This is great, you know. And then they never practice because they rely on their talent. Yeah. So they never get any good and then ultimately might even end up giving up. Yeah. Whereas a student who doesn't have that natural advantage straight away, they have to work quite a bit harder. And so they do usually. And then <laughs> they end up being a better musician or a better drummer. The other thing that bugs me about talent is people saying how talented you are. That really, yep. really bugs me. You are so talented. Yes. You, oh my God. Kane, you're such a talented drummer. It's like, okay, I was a talented drummer when I was 14. Now mm. I'm a skilled drummer. I've been playing for 20 yeah. years, man. Like this talent doesn't There's a big difference, carry man. me for 20 years. Yeah. I don't know if you've listened to, I interviewed Dylan Elise on my yet. podcast. No, not yet. Okay. But everybody knows Dylan. Yeah. He's, you know, he's drum guy in New Zealand. Mm. He said something so profound that I cut it out and put it at the front of his episode. Yeah. When he was at high school, he practiced for 12 hours a day. Bullshit. Serious. How? Well, he was homeschooled. Okay. To start with, 12 hours. And remember, this is New Zealand's most talented drummer. Yeah. In quotation marks. Yeah. How are we ever going to know how talented Dylan is? He practiced 12 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't make any kind of sense at all. No. I, I remember seeing Dylan. I've never lived in Wellington, but, mm -hmm. I've been, but I've been there you know, many times for shows and tours. Almost every single time I'd go down, I'd see Dylan on the street playing the drums at some point. Yep. This is yep. years and years ago. And he'd have like almost a whole kit, like sort of like a whole street kit, you know, and he'd just be smashing out these rad jams big crowd around him yep. and it was like every time like three or four times in a row I saw Dylan on the street I thought man that guy he's really good and he plays he must play a lot because he's always out on the street but Hell yeah. 12 hours that's that's kind of insanity I I want to kind of preface this discussion in context to that by saying that's crazy talk 12 hours and 
for, for the average person, that's right. not going to be feasible and not even advisable to even try that. Sure, sure, just, sure. You just hate, you'll hate the drums if you try and practice 12 hours a day if, <laughs> if you're not Dylan, you know. It's not for everybody. Yeah. That's absolutely true, man. But I think at the same time, it's worth noting if you want to be as good as Dylan, sitting on the couch watching drum YouTube videos, it's not going to push you over that, you know, pivotal point to those crazy level chops. So I think for me, it just puts things in perspective a little bit. And when students get really downhearted because they come back to a lesson and they can't play a fill or, or a beat. Mm. And then you ask them, oh, you know, well, how much did you practice that? Oh, well, I didn't practice it. Well, hey. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't help you there. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't do it for you. Yeah. It's, we're we're going to get to practice in a bit more depth, I reckon. Mm -hmm. what, what other myths have you got? I'm interested in this whole approach. Okay. The other one, I was just, actually, I was just talking to a guy called Rob, Rob Beatdown Brown on yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, do you know him? You, he's a big YouTube personality. I know of him. Yeah. Right. And he's, he's awesome. Me and him, we just, we agree on a lot of things, but this is the other myth thinking a piece of gear will solve a problem with your plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not direct thinking. It's, I think it's a subconscious, you know, marketing-driven thing. Yep. And we see all our favorite drummers playing, you know, DW collectors and all these amazing kits. So we think, oh, that's what, a, that's what it takes. That's what a great drummer uses and that's what a great drummer needs and... Yeah, it's got literally nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's true. And I had a, I had just an amazing conversation with Rob on Tuesday about this because he he's really big on this. Mm. So that was just ah oh, man, I was doing cartwheels talking to him about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so convenient to think that gear will help because everyone wants to continue to collect shiny new gear, right? This kick pedal is going to make me you know, so much faster because it's so much better. And But secretly you're thinking, I can't wait to get rid of my old shitty kick pedal and get a nice flash new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, new's always better, right? Yeah, always. And just, I mean, a funny aside, because I teach at what used to be known as Drum City. Mm. There's a re retail store in Balmoral. And we would always laugh because the, the boys in the shop would talk about customers coming in not that we would laugh at customers of course you, <laughs> of course. Know, you can't do that <laughs> but we'd always laugh at customers who would come in and they would ask questions like what's your fastest pedal yeah, and i'm yeah, not yeah. kidding man yeah. that was the question one guy brought his hi-hat stand back and said i need to swap this hi-hat stand it's not fast enough and i mean you just you know yeah you have to cover your mouth and try not to laugh and Swap his high hat stand. Yeah, yeah, sure, man. Do you want the more expensive one then? <laughs> man, my, my tutor at uni, Ron Sampson, he told me a great piece of um, advice. He said you'd learn, he was using a ride symbol as an example. Mm. You'd learn the ride symbol. You'd learn a specific ride symbol. You don't just get a ride and then say, oh, this sounds like, you know, garbage. Yeah. You'd learn, you fellowship with the piece of gear. Yeah, you learn it. It's part of the journey. Yeah, you know, like it's it's part of my first drum kit was a really crappy drum kit with crappy cymbals and stands and and you know stock heads and it sounded like crap. Yep. But I had that drum kit for like I want to say like eight years maybe, and like built yep. it up and and you know slowly invested in it. Got a pedal, got new heads, you know, got a couple <laughs> of new stands, got cymbals and like and by the end it was quite a decent sounding kit, you know crappy yeah. as though it was but but for so long i learned how to make it sound good yes and that's what that's what you're kind of getting at i think is it that is the journey man yeah that is it and it's it's part of it it's part of becoming the musician that you want to be and not just immediately jumping to a yeah the a three thousand dollar drum kit and then sitting down and going why doesn't it sound good mate it's because you don't sound good <laughs> i'm telling you man if you're not a proficient drummer if you don't have mileage, either gigging or in the practice room, mm. and then you drop, you know, your 
monthly wage or whatever it is on a on a DW collectors. It's not gonna sound good. Yeah, it's a it's as simple as that. And it's it's that uh, I've I've heard it multiple said multiple times. I don't know whose whose story it is, but it's like saying what I want my drums to sound like Dave Grohl playing on Nevermind. Why don't right. why don't my drums you know why don't I sound like that? It's because you're not Dave Grohl playing drums <sighs> for, on Nevermind. <sighs> like that's the yeah <laughs> right yes <laughs> that's it. And the flip side of that, Kane, is if I found a two hundred dollar Ashton kit, and I put Dave Grohl on that, the Ashton's going to sound like a million dollars, man. It's going to sound like Dave Grohl instantly, guaranteed. Yeah, Dave Grohl doesn't need a DW. It's not Mike Mangini. Who was the old drummer for Dream Theater? Portnoy. Yeah, Mike Portnoy. Mike Portnoy. Uh, um, yeah. He he's releasing these YouTube videos, and it's him playing different songs on a kid's toy drum kit <laughs> i love it yeah 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 it's really cool um and and of course it sounds like a kid's toy drum kit but it's mike portnoy playing it and so it sounds yep. awesome you know <laughs> yeah so it's just yeah. it's a, like a hundred dollar you know trash kids drum kit but it's it's great i love that yeah i mean i'm an advocate for good gear for for solid gear i mean you don't want you don't want hi-hat stands falling over and First song of the night, you put the beater through the bass drum or anything silly like this. Yeah. But I would steer you away from focusing everything on on the gear as opposed to the to the skill mm. of the player. Yeah. I kind of want to get into education a bit, and I want to talk yeah. about you f- to start with. Are you trained or are you self-taught? I guess I'm trained. I'd say I'm trained. Man, I struggled to learn everything on the drums, dude. Mm. I was not a natural so i got tutors early on up at drum city frank gibson jr was one of them chris harford was another one uh michael franklin brown bunch of guys yep i was um doing this and that playing in the odd original band nothing nothing that you would have have known about then in 2006 i took the plunge and went to auckland uni did a jazz degree, jazz performance. Sweet. So I guess in that sense, you'd say I'm probably heavily trained. Awesome. And did can you read all forms of music or are you just a drum notation reader? At university, we had to play piano and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, I could hack my way through treble clef, <laughs> yep. you know, yep. but um, definitely not at a gig or anything like that. Absolutely not. But you can sight read a drum music. Uh yeah. Yeah. And I get I get hired for that a lot. Yep. With theater shows and that kind of stuff. So is is that like a it would be a prerequisite for shows like that, I suppose, and other shows like um, you know, where you're required to just sort of fill in. Yeah, man. That's almost a forgotten skill, man, for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. And it's probably it's probably half my income, dude. True. Which is a lot, man. That's Think yeah. of halving, you know, you can only take half the work that you normally would. Mm. If you can't if you can't read well, then um you're really limiting yourself, you know. And and so how long do you think it took you to become proficient in sight reading? A long time, man. A lot longer than I thought it would happen. Yeah. I wasn't even proficient at university, which was shocking to me. I thought after three years of man, in the trenches practice that i was going to be this you know world-class drum god yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and uh unfortunately that didn't happen man (laughs) hey there's still time yeah but it did it did give me the um the grounding to decide okay i want to focus some energy over here so i had the um fundamentals to kind of head off in that direction and and improve my reading and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's yeah. sight reading is, is a difficult skill, and I've been reading drum music since I started learning. Only periodically, I've taken massive breaks from even bothering with drum music. Yeah. I can sit down by myself and play through something slowly, you know, and maybe make a couple of mistakes and fix them. And generally, I can you know get the gist. But I wouldn't call my. I wouldn't say that I'm able to sight read. You know, I wouldn't be able to get up and someone give me a bit of music and be able to play it in front of people. 
um, along with others. Right. That would that would not work. What I'm trying to say is, I guess there's a big there's a big leap to take from just understanding how things work and being able to read it fast, or and actually being able to sight read. Yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions about what actual sight reading is. Mm. I'll, I'll give you an example. I did a cruise ship gig in 2014. Sight reading was crucial for the gig. One of the things that we had to do with the band on the gig, it was basically a live karaoke set. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Probably sounds quite nasty. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we had this, each, each player had a book of songs. Uh, oh, a couple of books. I mean, you're talking folders and folders and folders of songs. And the guest would choose which song they want to play. Mm. I would get in my earpiece. Okay, the next song is track number 228. Man, I feel like a woman. Go go find it. Tell the band. That's the number. So I, t- I tell the band, track 228, Man, I feel like a woman. Everybody goes to their folder, finds the song, opens it up. The person coordinating the the playback track says, we all good. I give her the thumbs up and then I hear one, two, three, four, and well, we're off. And, and is there a click in your ear as well? Yeah. In that situation, I was the only person with a click. Yep. So we had keys, guitar, and bass with nothing. I was kind of the conduit. I was the yeah. in-between. Yeah. yeah. And obviously the click is going to keep the guest in time with the music that's rolling up, you know, the lyrics yeah. Yeah. that are rolling up in front of them. So A, you have to play in time with the click mm. and B, it's a complete 100% sight read. Oh man, that sounds like a nightmare scenario for me. <laughs> yeah, well, but that is probably, that's probably the best way I could explain the best scenario of what actual sight reading is. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, but it's, it's the click as well. If you like lose your spot or something, you're automatically behind and uh-oh. You can't you lose know. your spot. Yeah. You there, just... there, there is no lose the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So hopefully that doesn't make me sound like I'm bragging or anything. That, that was just the, the gig. That's what it was. Yep. And man, there's nothing to, you know, they say pressure creates diamonds, man. So there's nothing to make you a better sight reader than, dude, you're playing in front of a hundred people, <laughs> in front of all these guests, all the other musicians are nailing it. Mm. Unfortunately, man, your time is now, dude. Yeah. <laughs> read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, read it. That's it. <laughs> and of course, this is another thing. Sight reading does not have to be note for note, man. Sure. You can take a snapshot of that piece of music and I might look at it and then within half a second, I might see an issue in the first eight bars. There might be something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. Okay. Hey, I either sidestep it and miss it. I might slightly alter the groove a little bit. Nothing, nothing crazy. It's not like I'm going to play, you know, instead of a shuffle, I'm going to play a 16th note hi-hat beat or anything. Mm. But um, yeah, just common sense, man. Like the song, the song always comes first, man. Yeah. No one cares if you, if you miss a floor tom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Or change your fill very slightly or something. Yeah. But if you go for a fill that is a bit 50-50 and you... And you completely, you know, stink the joint out. Then yeah. that's bad. That's bad musicianship. <laughs> there are signature licks as well that you need to hit. You know, some yes. songs have that fill, like that. You just you have to play it perfectly. You can't yeah. change it. Yeah, because there's going to be some guy yeah. in the crowd air drumming along, and you know <laughs> he's going to glare at you if you <laughs> if you change it. It's so true, man. I find that with um, "Sweet Child of Mine." Oh, if we yeah. <laughs> if we do that with the covers band, as soon as we get to the guitar solo, you've got five dudes who all of a sudden just zero in on the guitarist. Yeah, they know it, and they're like, 
Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Oh, oh, he got that bit. Is he going to get the next bit? <laughs> yeah, note for note, please. And if you, you do to, like man. bung a note or like decide on a different note for the solo because it's your artistic freedom, you know, you're going to get that guy or five of them coming up to you after the gig going, oh, yeah, wicked man, cool guitar sound, wicked, you know, solo and sweet child. But, you know, you missed that note. Yeah. Oh, people love to remind you if you if you don't do something quite right. How are you with music theory? Like, do you, you know, do you have a sort of broad knowledge or does it apply specifically to drums? How deep have you gone uh, there? No, it's, it's really bad, man. I've been really slack. Again, we did do arranging and all that, all that cool stuff at university. And even though we were drummers, the drummers in the course, we were not immune to having to arrange big band charts and all that crazy stuff. Yeah. But I've completely let that muscle go, man. Yep. I, I, I actually, I just don't have time and it's not, it's actually not a bit of, a, not a burning passion for me mm. to be arranging music and, um, and even writing music at the moment. It's not, it's not a priority for me. Yeah. But man, who knows? You never say never. I mean, the fundamentals are, will, will be there in some way. Mm. So if I ever did want to, you know, write an album or, or do something, I'm, I don't know. I think I could do it for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. kind of the same. Like I uh, have a music degree and I did three years or four, four years really of theory mm-hmm. and music studies, you know, really, really intense. And it got to the point, you know, quite a high level where everything is a bit subjective even. You know, you get to a point where you can kind of yes. know the rules so you can break the rules and then there are no rules. And yes. I, I actually did get to that point. But as, a, as you, I don't stretch that, that muscle. And I haven't since that point because it was yeah. it was hard. It's really, really hard work and it's not something that I want to do every day. And so, yeah. And it's time consuming, man. Whew. It's like maths, you know, you have to be dedicated to it. Uh, and so if you don't, if you don't use it, you lose it. And um, the same as you, I do have a solid grounding in it. I think some of the stuff will never leave uh, and I'm grateful for that. But yeah, if I wanted to get back to that level or even start to teach it or anything like that, there'd be a lot of work involved. Uh, I'd do really appreciate knowing a little bit of theory and a little bit on a couple of different instruments. Yeah. It helps me in lots of different situations when working with other musicians. If you're trying to put an idea across, if you have no way of communicating that idea, uh, you know, it's going to be really difficult. Um, Yes. That's the main advantage I find from being educated in theory uh, and in harmony and just being able to, to say, you know, hey, that's that's a bit sharp, you know. Maybe you should play an A instead, or let's go to the five here and let's go to the six minor here, and just little things like that that most people sort of understand that have played for a while, and yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Oh, 100 percent, man. I always tell my students, um, especially the ones that are kind of starting to get good, but they're shying away from the theory side of it. There's really no reason in 2018 for the drummer to be the only guy in the band who doesn't know anything about music. That's inexcusable to me, man. If you're at a big band rehearsal and the MD or conductor says, okay, guys, we're going to do a big stop on the four of bar eight. And if the drummer's the goof that is sitting there going, huh? Yeah. That's, that's not cool. Yeah. That's why we have drummer jokes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it is, man. Guitarists are bad for this as well. You know, the old thing. How do you, how do you make a guitarist shut up? Put a piece of music in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. Guitarists and drummers, for some reason, we've got that rep as as dumb, loud, and dumb. It's because you don't need. Okay, so you don't need to learn much music theory or anything about anything else if you play guitar or bass or drums you can get by quite happily using tab uh, and simple drum notation or just your ear absolutely you can you can make it pretty far you know there's a few cases of really famous musicians who can't read music but those guys are the exception (laughs) right oh yeah most people who who make it far and and who have a career in music they can read music and they understand it in many different ways and they can communicate with it. Uh, and yes. there are so many advantages to that. I can think of one disadvantage, but 
the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages of mm-hmm. being able to speak fluently or at least communicate basically in the, the language of music. Do we even need to go into advantages? It's just that's a hundred percent, man. Like even if you took let's let's take um, Lady Gaga, uh, Katy Perry, Dr. Dre. We could go on and on. Some yep. people that you might not expect would require this kind of knowledge. These people are genius, man. Yeah. These people are so entrenched in uh, theory and musicality. I mean, Dr. Dre, I think I heard somewhere that he's he's doing a classical degree. Mm. So, I mean, it's super important, man. I always think about it like I've traveled a fair bit, right? And there was one party that I went to in this crazy sort of place in France and it's like a snow chalet up in the mountains Uh, and it was a friend of mine who's French and it was her birthday party and we went to this party and there's 20 French people and me and my wife and most of them don't speak any English and we felt like toddlers you know (laughs) Like, because we we couldn't communicate with these people and the only way that we could is if they knew how to speak to us in, you know, in this kind of basic language. If you think about it like that, yeah. if, you, if you go into a room of musicians or in any scenario where there are professional musicians and you can't speak their language, then 100%. they're on a different level to you. Yeah. How can you communicate? Language is the perfect analogy, man. And music is a language. Yeah. Totally. So, I mean, this conversation we're having right now, you're not thinking, oh, I've got to do a pronoun and then I need to, uh, uh, I think it starts with an A and then I need to leave a gap. (laughs) You can't communicate like that. And you can't communicate music. If you're thinking about everything, I need to do a right here, then I'm going to do a left, then I'm going to do a bass drum, then I'm going to do them really fast. No, that's baby steps. And there, there was, I mentioned that I thought there was one disadvantage to learning music theory. And it's something that one of my old friends, he expressed this when I said that I was going to study music. He was like, yeah, it would ruin it for me. And <laughs> Yeah, I've heard and this. To, yeah, and to a, to a degree, he was right. On the one hand, studying music made my entire life what it is. I met my wife doing my degree. You know, music is my life now. It's how I do everything. But at times, it has kind of ruined the pure enjoyment of music for me. While it has given me much more enjoyment and a deeper level of understanding and connection, in some ways, at some times, yeah, it does kind of bum me out that I sort of overthink it. I mean, I can't speak for you and your experience, but I would put that down to just possibly oversaturation of yeah. music in your life. Yeah. Benny Greb, you know Benny Greb, the famous yep. German drummer? Mm-hmm. He had a fantastic analogy exactly for this. And he said something along the lines of, you know, we, we can look at this massive tree and admire the beauty of it. And, you know, just, you know, how many years did it take, you know, and all this wonderful stuff, this nature that's going on with this tree. But then if a scientist came along and told you in depth, you know, this tree is a thousand years old and it grew up through this age and the roots are this deep and it required this type of soil and it grew because of this. That's not going to make you think the tree is less beautiful. It's, I mean, it's only going to enhance the respect and the admiration. And I don't know, I'd agree with him on that. Sure. I can't see, I can't see how more knowledge is bad. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss in, in the way that sometimes I would love to turn my drummer brain off and just go to a gig <laughs> or right. go to a concert and just, and just have fun. Oh, you, and, there's and, a, um, there's a great way to do that. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, but okay. Is, yeah. Are we yeah. not allowed to talk about it? Oh uh, no, no. I think we can talk about it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Smoking weed is is fine. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know know how many kid uh, child listeners I have, but yeah, whatever. You're absolutely right though, man. And this is probably why a lot of creative people and especially musicians, they do turn to to drugs, man, because we're always searching, man. We're always searching. 
yeah. as creatives, right? Yep. Bigger and better experiences. It's a never-ending journey as well. It's the more you learn, the less you know, right? It's an old saying. Um, oh, 100%. But it, rings, it rings so true. On your point, I would say, and definitely not saying that I'm a any kind of master drummer, but the better I've gotten, the less good I feel about my drumming. Sure. That's not to say I'm insecure and I get nervous when I go out playing, mm. but I just realize, holy shit, man, <laughs> I'm a rank beginner, dude, because <laughs> now I can hear the genius and, and, the, and the great drummers. Yep. And, and the great music performances. Yep. You know, whether it be something simple like Back in Black, which could have po- completely gone over your head when you're 15 because you think, oh, I can play that on the drums. It's easy, yeah. But wait up, wait up, wait up. <laughs> you can't play that. <laughs> you learn to appreciate nuance as you become uh, more advanced yourself. Oh, absolutely, man. I was kind of having this chat with uh, one of your former guests, um, Sam Holdham. Oh, yeah. About uh, like the genius of songs like that. Yeah. The genius of Nevermind, the genius of these seemingly simple performances, but when you dig a bit deeper, they're actually the genius in the simplicity. Yeah. It's what you said before. It's about, it's about the song isn't it? It's not, it's not about the drums. If it's a drum solo, then it's about the drums. If, if you're playing in a song, it's about the song. Let's talk a little bit about practicing just mm-hmm. for those people who are listening, who are kind of maybe struggling with that a little bit. I think yeah. when I was on your podcast, we talked about it. We've touched on it briefly, how we find it hard to motivate our students to practice. And quite often you'll, yeah. they'll come to the lesson and that's their only practice for the whole week. I mean, I've done things on this before, um, so I'd, I'd, maybe I'd like to just get your perspective on it. What do you do to motivate kids? How, how do you find the time? Uh, how do you get motivated? What are some tips? Specifically for kids you're talking about? For anyone. I think something that can apply to anybody. Okay. With kids, it has to be fun. Yeah. It can't be an after-school maths project for them. It needs to be something completely different. They get to be loud. They get to be a bit, you know, crazy. Yeah. And have some fun, man. If it's not fun, actually, probably with adults as well. Yeah. It's a big release for a lot of adult students. Totally. There's no step two without that. 100% has to be fun. You have to enjoy coming to the lesson and you have to enjoy jumping on your own kit. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Total dead end, man. So maybe if you're not playing, if you know, if you're finding yourself sitting at home playing your instrument and not wanting to pick it up or not finding yeah. the time, the first thing is that maybe you're not doing the thing that you should be. Well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with giving it a rest. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's nothing wrong with having a break. One big thing is for me is fueling the fire, like, and that could be go to a drum clinic, go to a concert. Doesn't matter who it is, just the overall experience is can be totally life changing, man. Yeah, I managed to convince a couple of students to go along to the recent Benny Greb Pete Lockett clinic. Mm-hmm. They are still talking about that drum clinic. Yeah, they didn't think it was humanly possible to do that, and there it is, man. Yeah, totally. That's yeah. the fire. Yeah. And now they're all interested in Benny Greb. They want to buy the DVD and, you know, they're 100% motivated on drums. It's part of like getting heroes as well. That was a big thing for me growing up is, is finding mm. heroes, um, finding bands that you just obsess about and yep. finding out who their drummer is. And, and as you say, going to clinics, I still talk about the Thomas Lang clinic that I saw um, in Hamilton 15 years ago like <laughs> yeah man i'm telling you man like when i say life-changing i'm not exaggerating i'm not you know overstating it actually life-changing i mean i'm not personally i'm not a big clinic guy mm. but i'm at a different sort of stage in the journey I, a, a different things float my boat at the moment but i think i think as a as a beginner drummer just seeing what's the potential of the instrument 
is is just so inspiring, man. What does float your boat currently? <laughs> uh, well, I would much lo- rather see uh, a drummer in a band setting. There, oh, there's this Indian guy on Facebook that's really, really lighting my fire at the moment, and he does this stuff okay. called like con- conical, I think it's called. It's all with his mouth. Uh, wow. And, and it's it's uh, it's a proper technique, and I'm kind of really, really butchering the description of it, but it's incredible stuff. It's kind of like an Indian mm-hmm. traditional style. It's like the yeah. you know that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's it's, fuck, it's so cool, man. And it really oh, every every video wild. I see, and I'm just like, yes. And then the other day he um, did a collaboration with three musos, and they covered a Meshuggah song, <laughs> and it was so cool. <laughs> And I don't know. Some people think it might think it's lame, but for me personally, I've I've found it, and it's it's inspiring me, and it makes me want to get on my kit. And so that's just oh, an example, you know, of something that find what kind of lights your fire and apply it to your life. And how would you ever have expected? Because you kept an open mind, man. And how would you ever have expected this Indian dude singing rhythms <laughs> with his voice? Yeah. And that gets you on the drum kit in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's kind of what the world needs, man. Like just that kind of collaboration approach. Yeah. You know? Never dismiss anything, man. It's all it's all valid. And even for me, I've got to stay open. I've always not been a solo guy. And then, you know, I'm open though. One day I might get it. Yeah. I'm, I might hear an incredibly musical drum solo and just say, damn, that was beautiful. Single tear will drip from the eye. <laughs> yeah. And I'll call you up and say, hey, man, we need to do another episode. And I'll, I'll see the light. <laughs> it's about solos. What are you doing now to, like, how, how often do you practice and stuff? I know you have a drum studio. So, yeah. you're, you know, you're in a good situation to do that practice. But what, what are you sort of putting in at the moment? It all depends. But my sort of base level thing is about an hour a day. Nice which is probably quite low for, uh, again, quotations marks professional drummer. It all depends, man. My bass level is an hour, and I'd divide that up between hands, independence, coordination stuff, drills, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. If I get signed up to do a theater show or something like that, that becomes the priority, and I'll do whatever I need to do to get ready for that. So that might be two hours a day, might be three hours a day for a couple of weeks. Sure. But I always um, always break up the practice. You never do the same thing, you know, every day, day after day. Yeah. There's some things that you have to keep going. Like I, I see the pad as that's like your vegetables. You just have to eat them to stay healthy yeah. on the instrument. And that makes you feel like you're always ready. I think the biggest challenge, especially for someone who's gotten past that beginner stage, is that murky intermediate world of of drumming Mm. where you don't quite have enough gigs under your belt and you've just realized that, okay, there's five million things to work on. What in the name of hell do I do? Hmm. That's when you need to find your why. Why are you doing this? Do you want to be the best drummer in the in New Zealand? Or do you want to be in a band that plays every Friday night? Because those are two very different things. And you're going to have to practice very differently <laughs> depending on, on what that goal is. Totally. totally. And that's, that's what it all boils down to, isn't it? I think we've, we've hit on it four or five different times in different ways. Yeah. Uh, it's finding that why, it's finding the fire, it's finding the thing that makes you excited about picking up your instrument and playing some music. And that's the most important thing. And if it is that motivation to be the best, then that's totally valid. If it's just that you really want to impress your mum, or you know, you want to, you want to play for your mates or you just love to play for yourself then that's good enough as well i think it's just finding and and realizing that and for some people it changes as well like and it's a whole journey that will consistently change throughout your life and your goals will shift 100 percent, man there's absolutely no way when i started drumming 
that I thought I would be um, sight reading, man, I feel like a woman, and baby got back on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> That's not how things work. Yeah. So you, you never know where you're going to end up and you got to keep an open mind. But of course, you can set goals, man. That is, that's a powerful thing. So maybe that was your goal. I don't know. Maybe your goal was to be to playing on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Then write it down. And then you can start working towards that. Yeah. Because there's going to be some requirements along the way that you're going to need to tick off. Mm. One of the biggest light bulb moments I had was I've got a producer buddy that lives in London at the moment. And this is, this is going back quite a while. I was all keen. I, I had got on the fire, man. I was watching my modern drummer DVDs and yeah. <laughs> I was fired up. I possibly thought I was a bit better than I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I, def- I definitely wasn't good. And um, he said to me, because he was much more experienced than me at the time. And he said, dude, go and do 50 gigs. You, ne- you need some mileage, man. Mm. Go, and, go and do 50 gigs and then come back and we'll see where you're at. And that kind of stopped me because I thought, I thought 50 gigs, you know, 50 yeah. is impossible. I'm not even going to do 50 in my lifetime. How do you get 50 gigs? <laughs> and man, that was just profound advice for me, dude. Mm. How important is mileage for a musician, man? Yeah, it is. I was, I was talking to someone last night about it. You know, they're just starting out and they're saying, you know, want to record songs. And I was trying to say, you, you've been a musician for like three months. You need to work a lot harder and you need to put in that mileage. Like really, mm. you need to write a hundred songs before you record yep. a song. Like it's yep. not just, you don't, don't just put out everything that comes to your mind. Kind of related to that is a lot of people miss the human side of music. There really is nothing musical about you sitting in your bedroom and playing the drums oh, and, and the greater scheme of things. Mm. It's necessary and you're working, you know, motor skills and you're getting muscle memory and all that kind of thing. I mean, I'll put it to you like this. If we took two people and you made one of them do 200 gigs next year, and the other person you may do 200 practice sessions, which, which drummer is going to be better? Yeah, the gigging drummer, no doubt. So, yeah, that is so key, man, and it often overlooked. Yeah. And again, my tutor at uni, he pulled me aside after first year because I was just going wild in the practice room, you know. Mm. I, I, would, I would arrive at uni when the doors opened at 8 a.m., and I was leaving at 11 p.m. Wow. And that's seven days a week. Wow, that's crazy. So he pulled me aside and he said, you know, I really respect, you know, you're working your ass off. It's clear. He said, go and play with a human being, man. <laughs> yeah. Play with a human being. And it, great, great advice, man. You know, you kind of have to learn everything and then forget it. Hmm. That's when you kind of allow the vocab that you've learned and the uh, the fluency. That's where the fluency is going to come from. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, a really good way to do that is uh, through covers as well. I know you play oh. covers. I spent the, – the reason I can play the drums like I can now is because I spent, yeah, probably three and a half years in a covers band. And it's not even that long, but it was informative years, you know. Um, oh, yeah. As I was a young drummer, and it just it changed me as a drummer. Uh, after that, after that band, I was ten times what I was when I went in. Um, as you say, it's just hundreds of gigs. Covers is great mileage, dude. Yeah, great mileage, and especially if you're doing uh, weddings and that kind of stuff, where you have to play quietly at one gig, then you've got to play loud at the next gig. Yeah, and then the songs have changed, and then you've got a sub singer, so you've got to learn a, five different songs. This is the life of a professional musician, man. Mm. You've got to think on your feet. You've got to be adaptable. If you can only play one volume 
and you only know 15 songs, you're not hireable. Yeah. At all. Let's let's call it. Do you wanna do you wanna say anything um, as a final kind of note to anyone listening, thinking about learning or getting into music education? Basically, man, keep it fun. Keep it fun. Work hard. Figure out why you're doing it. Set some goals, and get a good teacher who's gonna hold you accountable to your practice and your goals. Well said. Nice one. And that's it for this episode. Thank you to Andrew Rooney for his wise words. Check him out at andrewrooney.net and facebook.com forward slash New Zealand Drama Podcast. Andrew's choice for the Artist of the Week is Auckland indie band Daffodils. Check them out at facebook.com forward slash daffodils are not for kids. So as always, thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe, review, rate, whatever you like to do. And feel free to send me an email or Facebook message with any comments or suggestions. This podcast and the website musiciansmap.org is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about community, honesty and positive progress. The experiences, stories and advice shared on the podcast are given freely with the hope that you can relate to them and benefit from them. If you've found this podcast enjoyable or useful, make sure to check out the Musicians Map ebook and audiobook about building success in music. You'll find it at musiciansmap.org forward slash books, Amazon and Audible. And buying a copy of the book directly contributes to the continuation of this podcast. There's also a free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want to get in touch and say hello, please do so via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. Thanks for listening and stay positive. <laughs>